Hello everyone, welcome back to Advent of Code 2023. Gonna do day four today. As usual, starting with a review of uh, a couple changes I made in between yesterday and today. Nothing too major this time. Um, first of all, I just noticed that this neighborhood function I put in just in case I wanted it. I never used it, so it's gone. <clears throat> and then I decided I didn't like this measured helper here. The idea was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna want to be able to like say, oh, there's this, you know, a space, you know, uh, the number takes up this much much space, which I did and was useful, and then also say, oh, there's spaces that are this long, and like, wouldn't measured be a nice way to do both of those things? And it was fine, but like, really, writing it even for the, it only ended up being useful for numbers basically. For blanks, it was totally fine to just always. To only consume one at a time and say, oh, there's not a series of five blanks or a single blank that's five long. There's five blanks, each of which are one long. And that was just easier. So I threw away measured and inlined it into number basically. Um, and then blank and symbol just always say, oh, it's measured one. Um, and to do that, I needed the, the sim. Although, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Needed sim from TextRig Explicative as well, hence the import change. And I also tried to update my Haskell tooling this morning. Uh, some some more comments had said, "Oh, you should you should update. Wouldn't it be nice to have a GHC ID?" Which is like, I thought you don't use that these days. You use Haskell Language Server, but whatever. Um, and it was just like it always is. It's fucking hell. I can't update Haskell tooling. It's just impossible. You know, I installed Emacs from source, uh, just like I built it from source because it has this new eglot thing, which is supposed to automatically integrate with language servers for various languages. Sounded very nice. Completely painless. I just had to download Emacs, run configure, run make it, and it's like, great, you have the new version. I'm not using it because I ended up not getting the eglot thing working, but Haskell, like, oh, GHC up you know, upgrade GHC to the newest version. It like does a bunch of stuff and then it just gets stuck in a loop and doesn't do anything and eats up all my CPU and all my memory. Like, fuck you, GHC up. I couldn't get any, anything updated. So we're using the same tools we always were. <sighs> and I don't even know if Stack is using the same version of GHC as GHC up was not be updating anyway. It's just awful. All right. On to day, uh, day four's puzzle. Hello, I'm clicking. There we go. Day four, scratch cards. You know, I could widen this window just a tiny bit, couldn't I? It looks about right. The gondola takes you up. Strangely though, the ground doesn't seem to be coming with you. You're not climbing a mountain. What? Oh. So like normally a gondola would be suspended from poles of a certain height. And as you go up a mountain, the poles stay the same height. And so the gondola is climbing, but like the ground would sort of come with you in a sense. This is just going straight up away from the ground, I guess. As the circle of snow island recedes below you, an entire new landmass suddenly appears above you. Spooky. The gondola carries you to the surface of the new island and lurches into the station. As you exit the gondola, the first thing you notice is that the air here is much warmer than it was on Snow Island. It's also quite humid. Is this where the water source is? The next thing you notice is an elf sitting on the floor across the station in what seems to be a pile of colorful square cards. Oh boy, punch cards. Oh, hello, the elf excitedly runs over to you. How may I be of service? You ask about water sources. I'm not sure. I just operate the gondola lift. That does sound like something we'd have, though. This is Island Island, after all. I bet the gardener would know. He's on a different island, though. Uh, the small kind surrounded by water, not the floating kind. We really need to come up with a better naming scheme. Tell you what, if you can help me with something quick, I'll let you borrow my boat and you can go visit the gardener. I got all these scratch cards as a gift, but I can't figure out what I've won. The elf leads you over to the pile of colorful cards. There you discover dozens of scratch cards, all with their opaque covering already scratched off. Okay. Picking one up, it looks like each card has two lists of numbers separated by a vertical bar, a list of winning numbers, and then a list of numbers you have. You organize the information into a table, your puzzle input. As far as the elf has been able to figure out, okay, so this is probably what's gonna change in part two, this rule here, because this is like being hinted to us as 
something we're not sure about. You have to figure out which of the numbers you have appear in the list of winning numbers. The first match makes the card worth one point, and each match after that first doubles the point value of that card. Okay. So we're doing set intersection here, it looks like. In the above example, there's five winning numbers in card one. All five? Four, oh. Oh, right. The leftmost is the winning numbers. Yes, okay. There are five winning numbers, not five numbers we have that one. And eight numbers you have. Of the numbers you have, four of them are winning numbers. Amazing, okay. Well, this looks a thousand times easier than the last couple days. So that's nice. We might, we might get a break for a change. Um, so let's see. Uh, we're still going to want text reg explicative. That sounds great. Um, I should honestly just put this in my template. I love, I love regexes for parsing. Um, I need... Um, right, regex. I need sim at all? I guess I'll just take, yeah, I need like, I probably do need sim and string and match and anything else you think? I don't think I need psim for anything here. And I'd like, uh, decimal as well, please. So let's let's write a parser for cards. Well, okay, we can't do that until we define a type for card. Um, let's see. So import data dot set qualified as s. Um, let's define data type card is a card with. Mm. I wonder, so obviously a card has a number, like the card number, card number one, card number two, and so on, that has winning numbers and losing numbers. I wonder if this is another time when it would make sense to, like, let's go back and look, for example, at day three. Um. Or no, not three. What day was it that I had? No, not the license. Get out of here. Numbered or something? I had a numbered thing. A game was a game of int and a. So game, really, you could have just called this like identified or numbered, right? Did I really not ever explicitly do that? I don't know. But I guess it's kind of similar to the day three thing where... I have like measured and located. These are ways to tag some information in addition to like the main information. And this, it seems, would be like a useful general tool, right? Like, I don't generally speaking build myself up a library of advent of code tools or templates or whatever. Um, so I don't reuse code between days. If I did, this is the kind of thing that would be nice to reuse. But I think we might as well do it here. Um, so card is a card of winning and chosen hours. I don't know. Which are both a set of int. Is int really good? Would I rather have like some type alias for ints that identifies them as card numbers? Let's say no. Um, so this is, this is the like general tool for, oh, if you just want something to be numbered, like attach some numbering information as kind of metadata to something else, right? And let's just say functor and foldable, at least we want to show an eek and org. That all seems fine. Anything else? I don't know. Uh, what do we want to derive here? Deriving 
Maybe just show, right? So here's our type for cards. Now, can we write a parser for a card? I think so. But let's maybe start a little bit um, before that. As usual, I'm writing. I, I I like to pretend that I'm writing a parser and not a regex. So I name a type alias for my regexes and I call it parser. Um, and this time, I think I will define spaces, uh, which is a parser of nothing. Spaces is unit mapped into many of, mm, do I want many or some? Do I want to require there be at least one space every time I write spaces? I think so. Okay, let's get control.applicative. I need a few things here, like some. I don't know that we need many. Is replicate m in applicative these days? Um, let's find out. Yeah, it's not in scope, of course. Mm, okay, is it? It's is it really in monad? doesn't the annoying thing is it doesn't mention monad in the type anymore they changed that it, it only you only really need uh, applicative to get this but fine it's in control monad um, What else do I need from control applicative at the moment? Nothing. I don't think I'm going to need a sum or anything. Now, hmm. I wonder actually if saving a set of ints is premature optimization. Because we don't actually know what part two is going to be, right? And we're throwing away information that the input actually has in it by saving a set, right? So I think, I think as part of our parsing, we should just take in a list of int. And then when we're running part one, we should make them both into sets and intersect them, right? This way, when we parse, we still have all the information. Uh, right? That makes sense to me. So let's say um, card is a parser for card. And Card is going to be card mapped the the card constructor mapped into replicatum five of spaces being ignored followed by a decimal. And then we're going to ignore the string space pipe. And then we're going to parse replicate them eight of. Well, you know what? Let's simplify my life, shall we? Um, where 
number is this? Replicate M5 or eight of number again. So I've, I've carefully arranged things so that, let me in fact, here, so you guys can see what I'm thinking about for a moment, we'll, um, nope, that's not how you do this. There we go. Oops, I pasted it twice because my right mouse button is janky. Um, but so, it, you know, the input looks like this, right? I guess I could go download my actual input. But the point is, I made spaces require at least one space, and I'm carefully arranging things so that whenever I use spaces, I expect at least one space. So my idea is that we'll start card parsing here in between the colon and the space. Then we'll parse numbers, each of which has at least one space in front of it. Then we'll parse this, and then we'll start here, and we're going to parse spaces followed by numbers eight times. So that's, that's the idea there. And line then is a parser for numbered card. Uh, line is numbered. Is this right? Yes. Numbered of um, string card. The spaces to decimal thing actually turns out to be plausibly useful here, but I guess it isn't really. We're going to ignore that string, and then we're going to parse a decimal. And then we're going to also ignore a symbol colon. Then we'll go parse a card. So do we suppose this type checks? Oh, whoops, yeah, that's the wrong import. It should be text rank explicative common, of course. Okay, this this type checks. Is it parse? Let's find out. Um, equal tilde line of, let me just copy one from the input. Hello, copying? You know what, forget this. Let's go download my input. <laughs> um, Hello, why can't I switch? Oh, I'm because I'm typing the wrong number for switch, which tab to switch to. Got it. Or not tab, a Tmux window, I guess is what they're called. Anyway, if I just say AOC input of four, please. Uh, then, I don't know, it kind of still sucks, huh? OK, I'll just copy it with my mouse from the browser. There you go. That's a card, numbered two. And it lists the winning numbers on the left and uh, our numbers on the right. Perfect. Um, let's make sure also, I guess, that it works on one that has single digit numbers. Yeah, looks good. Good, good, good. So a nice, easy parser today. Um, so our input, I guess, will be a list of numbered card, which means we need to update our prepare function to do the parsing. Um, but it's easy as always. It's map maybe of equal tilde line composed with lines. Simple. And again, this is going to drop things that don't parse. I always, I don't know. If I were building my own library of advent of code tooling, one thing that would be in it is a function that like does this, but if there's an error, it reports the error instead of just dropping that line and leaving me to cry. Um, but unless I have reason to suspect my parser might not be correct, this is easy enough. I have done that in past days when parsing was tricky, but Okay, so anyway, we have a we have all this. So part one, we're out, what do we actually output? A string? How many points are all the scratch cards worth? Okay. So it's sum dot map value, basically, right? We have to decide the value 
uh, but that's that's all we're doing. Where value of and we don't need the card number, by the way, but we have it just in case. Oh, actually, in that case, I guess we can. Can't we easily throw away the card number here as part of a map? Obviously, we can. There's no, we don't have a function that given a numbered A gives you back the A, but like foldable must have one. I guess it has one that gives you a list of the A's. What's in, what's in foldable? What do I get? I mean, yeah. Ah. Maybe I can use the sum and product here. Because. Mm, I mean, I could. It seems kind of tacky. Because we know our foldable always has exactly one thing. So if we just call sum on the, the foldable, it'll give us, like, the number. It's kind of a get function. Uh, it's, it's a little bit abuse uh, of, well, okay, let's not reload because we're in the middle of stuff. But um, we did, like, numbered five. Here's our, here's our card number one. But it's not storing a card. It's storing an integer. Um, numbered again. And if I then say sum of this, it should give me five. Yeah. Because foldable looks only at the A's in your, you know, foldable of A. Uh, so here, one is an int, right? In our definition of numbered. Numbered int A. So this int doesn't participate in the foldable type class machinery. Foldable gives you back, it's basically a way to access all of the A's in your type. And we know there's exactly one. So if we say sum all the A's in our type, it'll just give us back the thing. So I was wondering if that might be a cute way to do something here, right? I can... Like... Right? I don't know. It's just stupid. Don't do that. Don't don't abuse the type system for no reason when you could write something totally normal. Where the value of a numbered card when got is um let's see. So the score for a card is not some perfectly lovely thing like two to the power of the number of hits you have. Because if you have zero hits, it's worth nothing. What what do you get if you is this even allowed? What is what is two to the power of minus one? That's not one? There you go. Ex yeah, an exception. Okay. So the types allow it, but you can't do it. Okay. Just thought it might by luck, give me zero. Um, if you want, obviously if you want, like, so this does not, of course, mean that Haskell does not support negative, right? You're, you're just, there's a different operator for uh, when you want fractional. This is just for ints, uh, and an int raised to a negative power doesn't make sense, so fine. Um... Let's say null winners. Oh, let's let's change this to winning. Winning. If there are no winners, then it's zero. Otherwise, it's two to the power of 
S size? It's probably called size, right? Winners minus one. Where the winners are S dot intersection of S from list winning and S from list got. Right? That seems pretty reasonable. Compiles? No. I don't have map maybe. Very funny. Uh, that is in data maybe. Should put that in my template, but I'm never going to change that thing, man. Okay, that compiles. Stack run, baby, run. Zero. All right, that's probably wrong. <laughs> probably wrong. Oh, null. S dot null. Why? Well, null is from foldable. A set is foldable. But a set should only be nullable if it's empty. It should only be empty. It should only return null if there's no elements in the set, right? So this, this shouldn't fix the problem. It is correct to make that change, I think. Yes. But it shouldn't fix the problem. Good. Okay, let's read the problem statement again. Just to make sure I did what I thought I was doing is what I was supposed to do. And then after that, we'll see whether what I did is what I thought I was doing. List of numbers separated by bar, winners, the numbers you have. Which of the numbers you have appear in the list of winning numbers? First match makes it worth one, after that it doubles. Card one has five winning numbers and eight numbers you have. Hmm. Well, okay, so we can test this, right? Um, sadly, value is um, an inner function here, and so we can't test it at the top level, which is what I'd sort of like to do. Um, Oh, I wonder if our entire parse failed. Aha. There aren't five and eight. There's just a list and then a list. I see. OK. That's what I get for believing that my parsing code could. I keep hitting the wrong button to switch to kill this buffer. OK. OK, so it shouldn't be replicate M. It should just be some numbers and then some numbers. And now I don't need replicate M anymore. Okay, a number. That's what I get for trying to solve the problem without ever looking at my puzzle input, I guess. Too low. Good to know. It's a little embarrassing. I try not to be wrong, obviously. Uh, too low. I mean, obviously, we can test on the example input, right? Um, like, let's just grab card one from their example, right? Um, Well, I guess one problem is we could just like not be parsing all the cards. There's a question.
question. Um, so let's say part two uh, also returns an int and it's just length. So how many how many cards did we successfully parse and how many were there? 116. There were 215 of them. Okay, that's our problem. Got it. So it's time to, to do that little, ah, look. Look, 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 look. There's not just car and then a space and then the number. There's some spaces. Okay. So, string card. Uh, oh, and in fact, yeah, we didn't even need to. We already had decimal ignoring all the spaces. We didn't have to put a space here. Right? Oh, no, decimal doesn't skip spaces. That's the one that... Okay. Spaces. There you go. Card, spaces, decimal, colon. Yeah? Seems better. Okay, that's a... We, I think we got all of them now, right? Yes, 215. All right, let's try giving them this answer then. That's the right answer. All right, a little, oh, no, don't look, don't look. We're not doing this yet. We have some Git maintenance to do. Got to always be a good developer. Um, okay, anything here I don't want to immediately commit? It all looks fine. Okay. I forget, stack. It wasn't printing error messages, right? It was happy with us. No warnings or anything. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So let's just say yes. Get commit day four part one. Okay, now we can go have some fun and look at a new problem. Just as you're about to report your findings to the elf, one of you realizes that the rules have actually been printed on the back of every card this whole time. There's no such thing as points. Instead, scratch cards only cause you to win more scratch cards equal to the number of winning numbers you have. Hmm. Specifically, you win copies of the scratch cards below the winning card, i.e. that come after it, maybe? Equal to the number of matches. So if 10 had five matching numbers, you did one copy each of cards 11 through 15. So everybody who plays the lottery just has an infinite number of cards? What are you supposed to like? The la what are you supposed to do if you hit on the last card you buy? Insane. Okay. Copies of scratch cards are scored like normal scratch cards and have the same card number. If you win a copy of ten and it has five matching numbers, it would win a copy of the same cards that the original card ten won. Aha. Uh -huh. Cards will never make you win a copy of card past the end of the table. I see. What's the question? How many total scratch cards do you have at the end? So this is like a dynamic programming exercise, right? Because... Once you figure out how many points card 215 is worth, then, which, which will be zero, by the way, um, if you win a card that tells you, oh, go have a copy of card 215, you could go play 215 again and say, oh, look, I won nothing. Um, but it would be better to say, oh, how much did the 215 score? Zero. Okay, I'll add one to that because I did win a copy of card 215. Yeah, total scratch cards, including the, okay, all of the originals and copies. You have one card one, two card twos, four card threes. Yeah, okay. So 
So this includes the one you started with. The ones ones you started with. Sure. Uh... Okay, so it turns out saving a set would have been fine. Because we really are just matching things like this. But also, it's not going to be any more efficient, right? To build the set up front, because we should only process each card once. Um, now... For doing dynamic programming, there are a few approaches. If we built an array, I mean, we really should, right? I just hate using arrays in Haskell. It's such a nuisance. I always have to look up how to do it. And like, it doesn't work very well with the concept of mutation. I don't know, you can use lazy arrays and it's fine. Um, or non-strict arrays, whatever. Um, I mean, I guess that's basically just the same thing as an int map. Uh, so in a, if you wanted to do this dynamic programming thing where you calculate the score for the last card, which, okay, we know will be zero. Um, and then calculate the score for the card before that, which might be zero or might be one. Um, and then calculate the score before that. You're right, we could go through the array backwards. Um, Haskell gives us, because like when you get to card one, you need to look up like, Oh, it gave me copies of two and five. How much are those worth? And if you don't already have those calculated, you won't be able to look up the answer, right? Um, and so it makes sense to start at the end. Haskell gives us the liberty of doing things either way because of laziness. We can kind of just do it all at once and let the runtime system figure out the dependencies. I think it would still, in principle, be slightly more efficient to do it backwards, but I don't know. It seems hard. I think like putting, you know, 215 thunks somewhere should be fine. So we need a function like, or a map that says like number of cards copied, total, total number of copies or something that says like, if you made this card, here's how many you, you copied. Um, yeah. All right. So let's, let's, Let's show you the, the the miracle maybe of tying the knot. It's always a fun one to show off, and um, I'll just use a map from int to int for our cards because we already have maps in scope, and you know int map would be a little more efficient, and arrays would be a lot more efficient, but the efficiency of the map data structure is not going to matter. Um, well, I don't even have map imported. <laughs> okay, I guess I could use int map then. Uh, non-strict int maps exist, right? An int map re-exports data int map lazy. Okay, I do want a lazy one. Don't give me the strict one, please. A finite map of, from keys of type int to values of type v. Careful to, f yeah, in, in map strict, which we're not going to use. They force values before putting them in, but... In this module, they don't do that. Okay, yeah. So that that is what I want. I want um, data int map lazy. Okay. So. Let's see. This, we need the value of a card for part one. We don't really need it for part two, right? We need like this, which we can just duplicate. It'll be fine. 
Oh, sum.map. No, it's not what I want. I don't want sum.map value. Uh, actually, what am I supposed to store? Like, I want, I want to be able to look up in my map. Um, like, what is the value for one, and have that be the answer, right? So, net cards. Look up one in it, please. Where um, net cards is, I think, all right, what are the map construction functions that I have here? Construction, empty, singleton, from set? No. From list takes a list of keys and values. I think, or keys just int. Um, I think that might be all I want because there shouldn't be any. Yeah, let's, okay. M dot, sorry, you guys should be able to see this, from list of entries. Oh, I'm gonna have to actually define a function parameter here. Uh, part two of cards. Um, Entries is do, and we're going to take numbered n of card winning got, take that from cards. Um, now we have our card number, our winners and losers. We'll say let. this, right? That seems right. These are all the cards. The, the numbers that won. And you win, you win one copy of the number below it. Yeah, so, okay. Um, this is a little... Something isn't quite right. Like, okay, so we can we can obviously say, like, we don't actually care about the specific winners. It can be s dot size of that. That's fine. But the problem I have is that I don't have a good way to account for the original copies of the cards in the in the sum that I'm computing, the way I'm thinking of doing it, I think. Because if I put in the map under one, uh, oh, you know what? What if I just didn't store? What if I didn't account for the originals at all in the map? That makes more sense, I think. Um, like how many, if you copy this card, how many new cards will you get? Maybe that's what net cards should be. Um, and so actually it's m dot, I assume the function is called size. Yes. Size of 
net cards plus the number of well wait a minute but then I'm only accounting for the things you copy from the first card so really shouldn't this just be the sum if all the map is tracking is how many things you get for copying this then I should just sum up its values and add its size, right? Plus sum of m dot elms net cards. There are other ways you could write this. For example, sum the result of mapping plus one over it or whatever. But but this this makes sense. So net cards, I guess makes sense as, as a name still. So my idea is here, it'll only be the number of cards you are copying. So if you hit one winner, let's say we're card number 10, for example, and we evaluate card number 10 and we find there's one winner on it, we should look up the number of cards that winning 11, that, that the number of copies that scoring 11 would produce, but add one because you made a copy of 11 as well, right? I think that makes sense. Oh, and you know what? I don't, N, there you go, card num. We do actually care what the card number is because that tells us which elements to look up in the... Um... Oh, what am I doing? I'm editing part one like a dummy. Okay, part two, we have n already. Or card num? Okay. What, what is, when you write that, you get an empty list? Good, okay, good. So the, the, the series of integers starting at one and going up to zero, that's none. Good, good, good. Just wanted to double check. Um, so I think we want to say that we are returning a number here and that number is Pure of, of course, because other, we're in a, do, a, a monad comprehension over lists right now. So if we want to return a single number, we have to wrap it in pure. Pure of num winners plus do? Oh my god, I'm a maniac. Somebody stop me. Uh, I don't know. Is this really the right... like? A list comprehension would honestly be simpler. Um, net cards look up index number card num plus i for i in one to num winners, right? So for the number of winners that we have, for each one, we're going to look up in the map of cards, how many, how many new cards are created as a result of scoring this card. Oh, you know what? I don't even have to add num winners here. I mean, I could do this, right? But actually, I think the other way is better. They're, they should be the same, because this list will be the size num winners. I could add one n times, or I could add n once. So this... I don't know, does this compile? Let's find out. No. Oh, good point. I didn't... Um... Card num, I don't know, I can get rid of the dollar sign. 
Pardonum comma all this. Because we still have to, we're, we're in, we're in from list. We need to yield a list of pairs of ints and values, not just values. Okay, that was one error gone, or maybe more. How many were there before? I don't know. Anyway, what are the errors that are left? Int and list of int. Oh, I have some parentheses in the wrong place. Okay. What is this? First argument of pure, argument of plus, card num plus i, for i and one to num winners. What are you upset about here? Second argument of plus, you're saying is a list of int for some reason. Oh, yeah, that's true. I am adding an integer to a list. Let's sum that list then. Okay, great. So what would, what would happen if I said stack run? Would I go to hell? I got a big number. Okay, let's see how it looks. That's the right answer. Oh, a miracle. Great, so let's I mean, I'm pretty happy with part two, to be honest. Day four, part two. But so let's talk a little bit about how this works, because this is always, I think, like, the first time you see this, it's a miracle. And it, it sounds a little bit like tooting my own horn, but I just like sort of glossed over everything that was happening. And so maybe it looks like kind of routine. Of course, we can just like compute for any number, like, you know, what it is based on what some other things are. But like, where where's the part where we did stuff um, like, like, where's the dynamic programming? There's a map and we look stuff up in the map, but like we look it up as we're putting it in the map, right? Isn't that kind of crazy? We say, oh, the net cards is just like, math, please build a list from entries. And what's entries? To build, to add um, an entry to the map using this entries list, we compute the card num from, you know, okay, from the list of cards that we got. Fine, totally normal. But, and, and we compute num winners by looking at the card again. But here, num winners plus the sum, the way to add something into this map that we're building with m.fromList is to look stuff up in the map that we're in the middle of building, right? Where's our base case? Where, how do we make sure that everything happens in order? Who, who, I didn't say do things starting with the last one. In fact, we're doing them in numerical order, right? We're just like looping over the cards in the order we got them. So what... What happens? How, how does Haskell do this? Um, and the answer is it's just the same as like, that's what laziness does, right? You, when we look up, um, or when, when we, let's say, let's say we're trying to compute like, okay, there are 215, 16, 215, I think, uh, cards. We're trying to look up the score for, well, let's start at the beginning, for number card one. And let's say card one has three winners. So we need copies. We need to know how much you score for two, three, and four in order to compute this list comprehension, right? So it's going to say, okay, I have to look up in net cards the number two, right? And I'll say, oh, I know what net cards is. It's this map to find out here. Ah, okay. And, you know, that map is being built from list. And so it's going to say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll look in the map. 
So from list kind of builds the spine of the map. Strictly, I think that sounds right. So when, when we evaluate from list entries, entries is just like a, a thunk at first. It's, it's an uncomputed value that Haskell knows how to compute if something needs it. This is what strictness and laziness do in general. From list says, okay, I, I need to know all the keys in this map right now. Please evaluate the first half of each tuple in the list. And so it goes through this list comprehension and it finds that it can compute the first half, the, the key, uh, looking just at the card, right? It never needs to look back at any at net cards, for example, to do this. So it says, okay, I have a list of 215 pairs and their first elements are one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And their second elements are deferred. We'll figure those out later. So it builds a map of 215 elements and then says, all right, I'm done building from list. Then when I finally try to call m elements and sum it, sum says, I need the value of the first element, please. And the map says, oh, you know, here it is. It's this unevaluated thunk that I didn't bother computing. You can do it yourself if you want. And sum says, okay, yes, I do actually need this first number. And so it finally then evaluates this. Num winners is easy to get, but it wants to add up the result of calling net cards on, again, let's say it won three times. That's called net cards of two and three and four. And so it says, oh gosh, you know, what's the value? What's what's the value in this key for store associated with key number one? Well, we're gonna have to look up the value for key number two and three and four and add them up. So it goes and asks the map, what's what's in value two? And it says, oh, you know what? I haven't computed that yet. But key two won one card. So it's just one more than the number you get for the value three. And it says, oh my God, I gotta go look up what's at number three. And it finally does that, telescoping all the way down to the bottom until it gets to the end and sees, ah, I've got zero copied for winning the last one. And then we have all these pending thunks that are depending on this computation. They all kind of get resolved backwards, propagating up the chain. And it's a miracle. So I think maybe if the list of cards were too large, this could cause a stack overflow and we would need to be careful. I'm not sure though. Anyway, it's very pretty. This, this, this is called tying the knot where, you know, in many languages, pretty much everything made since the 1950s, you know, recursion is a thing you can do. You can write recursive functions. In relatively few languages, can you write recursive data structure? Well, okay. Recursive data structures are also completely normal. Uh, write a, a tree node that contains a tree node. Um, <clears throat> for example. But, I mean, and I guess it's even true that like you can make cyclical data structures in mutable programming languages where you modify a node to point to, to say, oh, what's my left child? It's my parent. I'm like, you know, now you have this cycle. Um, but in Haskell, where you ca can't modify anything after making it, it's kind of magical that you can make a cyclical data structure where the value of net cards itself depends on and refers to the value of net cards several times. And the runtime system figures out all the dependencies and evaluates things only as needed. And so you can do this kind of dynamic programming thing by just like throw stuff in a map, assume that the map has already been fully computed except for the one entry you're looking at. And the runtime system will make sure that's actually true, uh, no matter what the dependencies actually are or the order you're doing things, it will do them in the right order. So anyway, I don't know, just kind of magical. I love it. Um, and we're done. Uh, with with today, right? Yeah, nothing else to do. Okay. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.